for all intents and purposes, it looks like we will have a president-elect Biden in the White House in January 2021. And I think under a Biden presidency, we will likely see a return to the JCPOA in some form or another. Um, we know that uh, Biden in, a, in an op-ed, which I believe he published with CNN in September, made quite clear his intention that he would rejoin the JCPOA as a starting point for what he called follow-on negotiations if Iran returns into full compliance with the nuclear deal. Now, of course, the big question we need to think about is what exact form such a return to the JCPOA will take. We know that uh, think tankers close to the Democrats in Washington have floated various options over recent months um, regarding how such a return to the JCPOA could look like one option being that the U.S. simply re-enters the JCPOA as is and that both sides, Iran and the Americans, roll back steps taken in contravention to the JCPOA and then maybe try to negotiate a stronger agreement over time. Another option that's floated is that the U.S., short of fully re-entering the JCPOA, tries for something that various analysts have called a calm for calm or freeze uh, for freeze. So um, a rollback of some of the American sanctions in return for a freeze or moderate rollback of some of Iran's steps that it has taken um, in terms of its nuclear activities. Now, of course, another option would be immediate negotiations for a new agreement with stronger sunset provisions and other elements. But to be honest, I think this is less likely to take place. Congress would be on, need to be on board for that. And of course, crucially, the Iranians have said repeatedly that the JCPOA, which is not a bilateral agreement between the United States and Iran, but a multilateral agreement endorsed by a Security Council resolution, is not up for review. So I think there are these various options, and I think American and Iranian domestic politics will have a major impact uh, on what we're likely going to see in the near term. Now, Biden coming in to the White House in January will have other priorities, including the COVID situation in the United States and the economy. And Iran itself has an, an election coming up in, in June of next year. So basically, you have a, a rather short time window between January and June um, where you can do something. And there is a debate, of course, as to whether and how that time window should be used. Now, I think one view in the United States is that Biden should aim for what I've called a calm for calm or freeze for freeze immediately. Um, and that would, of course, entail a full or partial return to the JCPOA along the lines of, of what I've explained and maybe some other confidence building measures with the Iranians. But actually, another view in the US holds that the US shouldn't rush into anything. It shouldn't rush into some, doing something before the Iranian elections in June, because even a more conservative new Iranian administration would likely eventually have no choice but to negotiate with the Americans, given the effects that the uh, maximum pressure campaign has had on Iran. So I guess there are complicated questions about windows of opportunity and, and leverage at play here. And I guess I want to draw your attention to one more important thing here that we should discuss, which is what will the Trump administration do before January 20th? We know that um, Eilid Abrams, who's the U.S. Special Representative for Iran, is in the region as we speak. I believe he left uh, last weekend for Israel. He's also expected in the Emirates and Saudi. And there has been talk uh, about the fact that the Trump administration now wants to use its remaining time to rule out more sanctions against Iran until January, related to Iran's ballistic missile program, the human rights situation, and of course, the goal of hitting Iranian in individuals and entities with further non-nuclear designations is meant to make it yet more difficult for the Biden administration to roll back these sanctions. Now, to be honest with you, it's a bit unclear to me what further pressure the Americans can add to Iran at this stage, because they've pretty much sanctioned everything they can sanction. But I guess if we talk here about the likely diplomacy on the JCPOA in 2021, 
there is this question as to how easily a Biden administration can dismantle the, the sanctions infrastructure that has been put in place. So I guess um, the bottom line here is that there are many moving variables. We haven't even yet talked about Russia, China, the Europeans, who I think would all welcome a return to the JCPOA and, and who will likely engage in their own diplomatic efforts over the coming months in trying to nudge the Americans or the Iranians into that direction. I personally think all sides will move cautiously after January 2021, but I guess I would just uh, emphasize at the end that it's overall encouraging that we will likely see a return under Biden to a diplomatic path, a diplomatic path that goes beyond sticks only or maximum pressure on the Iranians and a diplomatic path that will in essence be a multilateral one and that will also entail a role for Russia, the Europeans and China. I'll probably end there. None of the global powers, the United States, Russia, Europe, China, have any interest in an, an Israeli-Iranian confrontation escalating into a larger military confrontation which would draw in the outside powers, so the kind of global conflict that you, you pose in your question. I mean, even in past instances, if you think about it, the US and Russia in particular have acted in concert to avert such regional escalation. For example, in 2009 and 2010, under then um, Iranian President Ahmadinejad, when there was concern about you know, is the Israelis escalating, um, Russia and the US worked together through the Security Council at the time, passing resolution 1929, but then also Russia held off on providing the S-300 to Iran in order to mitigate such concerns on the Israeli side. Of course, for Russia, you know, an escalation between Israel and Iran that would have wider ripple effects would have significant security implications for Russia's own neighborhood. So I think there's an interest here by all outside powers to pre prevent that from happening. Now, that being said, if we just want to return to the, the conflict potential between Iran and Israel, I think part of why the JCPOA didn't prove viable and sustainable the first time round was that the Obama administration, which was so adamant to get a nuclear agreement with the Iranians, didn't take sufficiently into consideration Israel's and other Arab states' perceptions that the balance of power in the region after the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, had over time tilted too much in favor of Iran, that Iran had started to exploit weaknesses in Arab states, was filling institutional voids, and pursuing its so-called um, offensive defense strategy through proxies that are you know, in states close to Israel, Lebanon and Syria, but also in Iraq and Yemen, of course, there was an expectation among some in the U.S. that after the JCPOA, Iran would slowly and over time uh, change its broader policy in the region because it would benefit from, from the nuclear deal, it would show more restraint. But I think what you actually saw is that by 2018, Israel and, and Gulf states had concluded that that hope had proved unfounded. I mean, if you spoke with senior experts and officials in certain GCC capitals over the last two years, you will have realized that their main concern with Iran was not the nuclear program, but rather those other Iranian activities in the region. And so what that suggests to me is that perhaps a complete delinking of regional issues from the nuclear file was a mistake. This is, by the way, not to say that one should have pursued complete linkage or a comprehensive ag agreement at the time linking the nuclear, the ballistic missiles and all these regional questions into one agreement because probably that wouldn't have been viable. But I think there is a need to accompany any nuclear diplomacy, which we will hopefully see in 2021, as I said in, in the response to your first question, to accompany that with a parallel conversation on on these regional issues. Um, so if we want to return to Israel's concerns vis-a-vis -vis Iran today, 
and the conflict potential that could emanate from those concerns, I guess the key question before us is what will the Biden administration do to address these regional concerns? And again, like on the nuclear, various ideas I think have been floated in Washington by experts, by track two efforts, as to how a parallel or sequential process that deals with the regional issues beyond the nuclear, how that could look like. You know, can it work? I think it's certainly a tall order. It's, it's a very difficult process to achieve, but maybe I'll just end by saying that I think there are a few signs for cautious optimism that such um, an additional process or at least elements of such a process aren't, pos aren't impossible uh, to pursue. Um, the first point is regarding the Israelis. Now, it's no secret that the Netanyahu government had excellent relations with the Trump administration, but that doesn't mean that the Israelis can't work with Biden. We know that uh, Biden and Netanyahu have had a friendly relationship over decades. And I think that um, from the Israelis' point of view, now they know that people who came up through the US system, who've worked the Senate, the White House, State Department, the NSC, they will now likely serve in key positions in the Biden administration. So for the Israelis, there's also a return to a degree of predictability and familiarity that they might well appreciate. I also understand that the Israelis don't look at Biden um, as a sort of as a second Obama who will repeat the mistakes of the JCPOA, but they anticipate that Biden could potentially be more hardline on the Iranians. So that's that's a positive thing here. Second, something else that could set us up for, for positive momentum on these regional issues, and that actually the Biden administration would be well advised to build upon, is what has been achieved in the context of the Abram Accords recently. Now, as part of that broader push that the Trump administration has engaged in, US officials have, for instance, been mediating between Israel and Lebanon on the maritime border demarcations. And such efforts, I think, if they're continued next year, could further play into diffusing regional tensions by extension also with the Iranians. And third, and here I want to actually turn to Russia, there is also a chance to bring in external players into a conversation about regional security. Now, Russia has actually shown an interest in discussing that, in discussing regional security, Iran's role within that, even though Moscow has always argued as a matter of principle that those issues are unrelated to the JCPOA. But actually just last month when Russia held the presidency of the UN Security Council, they actually convened a debate on Gulf security arrangement. So there's also appetite here by major external players other than the United States to support such a conversation. So I think the bottom line here is if we talk about addressing the broader concerns between Iran on the one hand and Israel, but also other Gulf states on the other, it'll require extremely deft diplomacy and I think real leadership and strategic vision um, to get the balance right between the nuclear file and these other regional issues between carrots and sticks, um, to get the timing of various steps right, how you construct such a multi-level process how you bring along possible spoilers, both from outside the region and within the region. So it'll be a, an incredibly complex effort, but I believe it should be tried.